We're going to be looking at Malachi chapter 1, verses 6 to 14. Uh, And this is really about how the actions of the priests are really emblematic of the heart condition of the whole of Israel. So I'll be focusing on the priests for a time, but it isn't just an issue for them. You see, the priests represent the people to God. And if there's an issue with the priests, it means there's an issue with the people. Uh, And it's about how they, by their actions, whether they say they despise the Lord's name or not, by their actions, the Lord's people are despising his name. And the Lord's name, who is great and should be feared among the nations, will not accept those who offer unworthy sacrifices to him. So that's a really important uh, message today through Malachi as we look at it. So I I would ask you, last week, and if you haven't seen uh, or heard the sermon, uh, you can find it on YouTube or on Spotify uh, for last week. Uh, And last week, in the first part of Malachi chapter 1, the Lord really opens up to the people by saying, I have loved you. Now, this isn't in response to the people and what they're saying. This is the Lord making a statement of fact. And then he proceeds to show Israel how he has loved them. Because the reply from Israel is, how have you loved us? And that shows the heart condition of God's people at the time. Quite often we get to a point where where our heart condition betrays us. And even if we don't vocalize such a question, Our actions show that that's the condition of our heart. We're really saying to the Lord, well, you say you love us, but how have you loved us? Lord, prove your love to us. Well, really, the right way to look at it is, how can I prove my love to God? So the Lord began the message to Israel uh, in Malachi by declaring, I have loved you. And this this book is a call to the people of God. The Lord isn't looking to break relationship with with his people then or his people now. He isn't looking to to find himself or you away from him. So he's asking two different kinds of people within his overarching people. You've got the remnant who are remaining faithful to God and then you have the people who are just putting in what they need to put in. Are given to God only what they really need to. Just to keep up appearances. So my question for you today is, how are you responding to the electing love of God? And what does your life say about what matters to you? We, took, uh, we spent just a wee bit of time just talking to the kids about that. If you were to do a graph of your life, Not just your time, but also your talents, your finances, everything that is you, everything that you have to offer. How much would be devoted to God? Now, it's easy to say, uh, we like these verses that we can take out of context where it says, you know, uh, no matter what you do, do everything unto the Lord. So then we can say, oh, I do this, I'm doing it for God. It may well be true. But there is a lot of instruction in Scripture, which which is to show God's people how we're supposed to react to his love. We really don't have to come up with it ourselves. So the two points I want to look at today is our worthy Lord and our unworthy worship. So first, we're going to look through the scriptures at our worthy Lord. And if the scriptures have, have, uh, the wonderful thing about the Bible is it offers both questions and answers to the questions. So it leads you towards questions that you want to ask, and then it points you by itself to answers. So first and foremost, 
we think about relationship. How is our Lord worldly? Well, the Lord seems to be pointing in Malachi chapter 1 to the fact that he has chosen a people for himself. He didn't need to choose Abraham. There is nothing special about Abraham other than the fact that the Lord chose him. There is nothing special about us today other than the fact that the Lord chose us. It isn't about what we had to offer God. is isn't what he, what he needed from us. He chose us. He acted out of love and claimed a people for himself. The Lord pointed to Esau and Jacob, and we spent time with the kids over in Powerswin looking at uh, that relationship. N- neither one of them really deserved it, uh, but Jacob was chosen. And God continuously chooses people who don't deserve it. I don't deserve to be chosen, but God has chosen me. The central theme of Scripture is that God has chosen to have relationship. And relationship is defined. When you get married, those who have been married uh, uh, will have vows who define the parameters of the relationship. When God uh, creates relationship, he creates a covenant relationship. And he defines himself. So let's look at ways that the Lord is worthy to his people. He is a father. In Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 and 23, it says this. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. You see that the Lord chose his firstborn son and demanded their freedom. Not freedom to be free, to do their own thing, to be autonomous, but so that they may be free to worship him. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 6, Is this the way you repay the Lord, you foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father, your creator, who made you and formed you? Again in Psalm chapter 66, verse 2. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Are you seeing a a pattern of what it means to be God's people? We are, are to be a people of praise, a people of worship. You see it even in the New Testament. Galatians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. The relationship brings with it reward but there is a call for us to show our love to God another uh, defining characteristic of our relationship with God is that he is our master again the scriptures make that clear as well Deuteronomy 4.10 remember the day you stood before me at Horeb when he said to me assemble the people before me to hear my words so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land and may teach them to their children. Reverent fear of the Lord. How we respect the Lord, how we respond to God is important. Deuteronomy 6, 2. So that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you. 
and so you may enjoy a long life. There's the responsibility for parents to be teaching the next generation and the generation after that how they are to respond to the love of God. Too often, parents have uh, let others step in in this area. It's not the responsibility of the church to raise parents, uh, to raise children in the fear of the Lord. It's the responsibility of the church to be fed, to be equipped, to be encouraged, to be taught, to then go and teach the children under their care how they are to live right before God. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. If we read the word of God in reverent fear of him, but we reject that knowledge, we reject the wisdom it gives us and the instruction that it gives us and how we're supposed to live our lives before him, then we are fools. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 13. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. Why do we spend so much time fearing the world, fearing what people have to say about us, but it stops us from living the Christian life? Why does it come into play? Why, why do we fear what our colleagues in work might think if they know we're Christian, what our bosses might think, what our family might think, our friends? Does it not tell us something that we fear the world more than we fear God, the one who created it, who sustains it, who holds it together by the power of his word? What does that tell us about how we view God? What does that tell us about how God's people at the time of Malachi viewed him? And really, is there any difference today? The church continues to move away from God, to do what the culture calls us to do. In Isaiah uh, chapter 33, 6, it says, he will be the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. How we treat God is the key to this rich store of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. He is the sure foundation upon the ch where the, the church stands. And us as individual believers must stand upon that sure foundation too. Fear and honor for God is a massive theme throughout Scripture. And really, it's all about thinking rightly about who God is. If you think about who God is as he shows himself by his word, as he's revealed himself throughout time, his power, his glory, his righteousness, his holiness, his love, his grace, his mercy. When you have a right understanding and a right view of God, it shapes your entire life. And we're going to be looking at that in Malachi, because it's a big theme in Malachi about fear and honor. Another title that the Lord has throughout Scripture, but you see it so many times in Malachi, is the Lord of hosts. You can ask yourself, well, you know, what does that mean? The Lord of hosts. In the Hebrew, it's Yahweh Sabaoth. Uh, a good friend of mine get, just gave me a gift not long ago that gave me the names of uh, the Lord in Hebrew and Scripture. Uh, and Yahweh Sabaoth is just one of the wonderful names to speak in Hebrew. And it just means the Lord Almighty, the Lord of heaven's armies. The name the Lord of hosts occurs, occurs some 261 times in the Old Testament. 
It begins in 1 Samuel, in the very beginning of 1 Samuel. And it is Yahweh who is the Lord of heaven's armies. The self-existent, redemptive God. However, Scripture also indicates another thing about the Lord of hosts. That God is the one who is ultimate ruler of the nations. We've seen that in the scriptures. We see it in Isaiah. He continuously shows his authority and his power to rule the nations. And ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns. He returns in power with the nations being a footstool. His enemies. But as the Lord of the nations, the ruler of the nations, he is the Lord of armies in general. And he is able to utilize any force he sees fit to bring about his purposes. Well, let's read this passage of Malachi before we go any further. From uh, verse 6, it should be on the screen. A son honors his father and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me? Says the Lord Almighty. Again, the Lord of heaven's armies, the Lord of hosts. It is you, priests, who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you? Says the Lord Almighty. Now plead with God to be gracious to us. With such offerings from your hands will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. But you profane it by saying the Lord's table is defiled and its food is contemptible. And you say, what a burden. And you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, lame or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands? says the Lord. Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. The, the Lord will not accept the least from us. If our hearts are not right before him, it is not an offering acceptable to God. No matter how much or how little we give, if our heart condition is wrong, the sacrifice, the offering, is not what he wants. And we're going to look at what that means for the believer today. What does it mean that the Lord is to have the love of the nations? In the Psalms, uh, chapter 22, verses 27 and 28, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. The Lord's dominion will extend across the whole earth. His kingdom knows no end. And ultimately, in the end, we see in Revelation 7, 9 to 10, 
It says, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You see, this continuous act of worship that not only extends into the past, into the present, but into eternity. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're saved, if you've accepted him, repented of your sins and trusted in him for your salvation and been born again, you, your, our lives are one of worship. That is the chief reason we exist. In fact, the chief reason for creation is that it glorifies and honors God, that it worships the living God. It magnifies him and shows him. How much more should we who have received salvation from the Lord our God be a people of worship? Are we a people of worship? Or do we just spend two and a half hours on a Sunday with him? Is this the Lord's day, as we claim? Or is it his two and a half hours? Well, let's look at what, it, what unworthy worship looks like. There's two parts to that. There's our actions and our attitude. And actions usually flow from our attitude. If we are doing something, it's because we have an attitude from where it springs forth. And it shows our heart condition. In Leviticus chapter 22, verse 22, the Lord says, Do not offer to the Lord the blind, the injured, or the maimed or anything with warts or festering or running sores, do not place any of these on the altar as a food offering presented to the Lord. Can you imagine being taken out of bondage, out of slavery of Egypt, being saved by the Lord? And in response to that, because the, the Lord always saves before he requires anything of us. The Lord never comes to you and says, uh, you're not good enough. Here's what you need to do in order to be acceptable for me to save you. Salvation comes first. And then he says, this is how you live as part of my covenant people. But can you imagine being saved, being taken out of 400 years of slavery in a foreign land, and in response to that act of love, you offer blind animals, injured animals, maimed animals, things with warts and festering sores, and you place them as an offering to God. How would your family feel tonight if you went out and you were driving one of the country roads, maybe you're up Peel Glen Road or whatever, and you see a nice bit of roadkill? And you think, well, that saves me. And you get your shovel and you put it in the boot and you slap it down on the table for dinner. How loved do you think your family feels then? This is what's happening. The Lord's people are given to God roadkill as a food offering. That's the actions What's the attitude that it comes from? Well, in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 32, it says, Now therefore our God, the great God, almighty and awesome, who keeps his covenant of love, that's an important thing, no matter how much we fail and God's people have failed down the centuries, God keeps his covenants. He keeps his promises. It says, keep, he, 
who, who, awesome, who keeps his covenant of love, do not let all this hardship seem trifling in your eyes. The hardship that has come on us, on our kings and leaders, on our priests and prophets, on our ancestors and all your people from the days of the kings of Assyria until today. There's an attitude that, oh, if I'm going through a tough time, it should change how I feel about the Lord. If I'm struggling today, what's it matter that he saved me 10 years ago? It's an attitude of, well, what have you done for me lately, Lord? Those of you who are parents here, how often do you get that kind of attitude from children? Uh, Every day, absolutely. (laughs) Every day. Yeah, it's it's not what you've done for me yesterday. It's not what you've done for me last week. It's not that you've cared for me these past eight, nine, ten years. It's, well, I want this, and you're not doing it. Yeah. What have you done for me lately? And we would we would say that's disrespect. We would say to the child, stop being disrespectful. Stop being cheeky. Are we any different to the Lord at times? All these truths from Scripture is great. It's wonderful to see what's happening in Malachi's time, how it relates to us today. But then we come to the question, well, what do we do with it? Because really, and it's not always easy, but we really should leave after a sermon with an idea of how we're supposed to put it into action. Well, let's look at a couple of points of application, how we can apply these things. And again, wonderful thing about Scripture. Scripture gives us the answer. Point one of application, praise God for a better priest and sacrifice. For many centuries, God's people relied on uh, priests who had to deal with their own sin and offered sacrifices that really couldn't take away sin but they were pointing to the sacrifice that could the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ in Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 it says Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us for it is written cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole that's what Christ was raised up on the cross in Hebrews 7, 23 to 27, it says, Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. High priests would come and go. Our high priest lives forever. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens, unlike the other high priests. He does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrifices for their sins once for all when he offered himself. Praise God for a greater high priest and a greater sacrifice. In verses uh, Hebrews 9.28, Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. I ask you today, are you sitting here waiting patiently upon the Lord? Are you longing for his return? He's made a promise to return. He's kept his promise, says in the past. He's proven who he is. He was raised from the dead to prove his ministry true and what he said about himself. And he will return. Do you live a life in anticipation of that return? Awaiting the one who took away our sin by his own sacrifice. In Hebrews 10, 11 to 14, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties, 
Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are made holy. Do you realize that if you are part of God's covenant people today, if you have been saved, if you've been born again of the Spirit, you have been made holy, set apart. You are the most important people on earth. We've just went through one election. There's an election in the States and elections left, right and center. And all these very self-important people who think they have the power of life and death the power to make decisions that change the destinies of nations and the destiny of the whole world and give no honor and praise to God. And they don't realize that it is the true church of Christ that is the most important people on earth. And their king is the one who shapes the destiny of the world. He is the one who will rule over the nations. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are no longer condemned. You were. And if you've trusted in Jesus, now you're not. Should, does that not create in you a desire to worship and be thankful to God? I mean, you're all sitting here quite gloomy. I've just told you you're going to spend eternity with the Lord. Be thankful for the great high priest and his atoning sacrifice. You are no longer condemned. You look like you're waiting on your last meal. Second point of application. Let us offer to God acceptable worship. Well, what does that look like? It's very easy for us to say, oh, this is how I worship the Lord. But how does God say we should worship him? Because that's really what matters. And I guarantee you, we will always find the easier route to worship, to fit God in. But God does tell us his standard of worship in response to his love for you. Hebrews chapter 12, 28, 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. That is what you're receiving. That is your, your inheritance. You're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. I guarantee you, if you're giving God roadkill and whatever that looks like in your context, you are not worshiping God acceptably with reverence and awe. We just aren't. And we should be mindful of the fact that he is a consuming fire and he'll burn up everything that isn't acceptable to him. In, verses th in chapter 13, verses 15 and 16, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. What is acceptable worship to God here? To be continually offering to God a sacrifice of praise. How often do you praise his name? Is it just a Sunday? Is it just a Wednesday prayer meeting? How often does the praise of the Lord your God rest on your lips and come forth to the world? Does the fruit of your lips openly profess his name? Is there a circumstance in your life where you are hesitant or fearful to share the name of the Lord with people. 
that your fear or trepidation of others is greater than your love for God? How does your good works, your charitable efforts look? How do you share with others? Do you give generously of yourself, your time, your talents, your finances, not just to the church, but to people? Do you see a need and think, in the Lord's name, I'll meet that need, if at all possible? Because with such sacrifices, God is pleased. And isn't it great to say that I have pleased the Lord? In Romans chapter 12, 1 to 2, it says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. For this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. What, what is an acceptable act of worship from the church to God? Our whole selves. There isn't a part of our lives, a part of ourselves that belongs just to us. And we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We have spent so much time in the world being trained by the worldly system, being taught to think a certain way, being programmed that this is how the world's supposed to be. But the truth is, we really need to be deprogrammed and this is how we do it. The word of God sets us free. We are deprogrammed and we live a different kind of life. And it's difficult. It is so difficult. Because we live in the very world. And sometimes to get by in this world you think, I don't have another choice. I just have to do it this, their way. The Lord is saying, trust him. Do it his way. Live kingdom lives now. Have a heart for God. And turn away from the world. In Philippians 4.18, I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from the, the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Here, Paul is speaking to the church at Philippi and is thanking them for support. The men at the men's fellowship are looking th through Philippians right now. And one of the overarching themes that we'll look at is that, that a testament to the fact that the church, the believers in Philippi, are truly saved. Paul says is, is the way that they partner with him in the gospel. That they sacrificially help him and the others in the, the work of the gospel. Paul goes so far as to say, I actually know and have great confidence that you're going to be there in the end. That when the Lord Jesus comes back, when he takes his church, he's going to see the Philippian Christians because of that. Is that true for us today? Could we meet that test? And then finally in 1 Peter 2.9, it says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. It's not wrong to think of yourselves as special because God does. 
you are inherently valuable to God. So much so that he sacrificed his son for you. He gave his son as a sacrifice so that he could have a relationship with you. Think of all the things that your better half done to maybe try and woo you, to to see you uh, accept them. They didn't go that far. Well, God says you are a chosen people, a holy nation, and his special possession. Why? Why are you that to him? Why did he choose you? So that you can declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Praise God. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ to everybody you meet. Nobody in your life should not know that you're a Christian. If you're sitting here today and there's people in your life who have no idea you're a believer, why? It's the reason you've been saved. You've been chosen. You're a special possession of God so that you can declare the praises of his name. So I'll finish with this. How are you and I, how are we going to respond to the love of God? Because that's the question. The people in Malachi's Malachi's time failed miserably. And God's people down the centuries have failed miserably. You read the New Testament letters and the church weren't doing any better. You look around the churches today, not doing any better. We will fall short that God is graceful and merciful and loving. And the truth is, we each have that opportunity to show God how much we love him. To respond to his love for us. Amen.